Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and just a reminder that we're just now I think three weeks away from fall semester starting which just goes to show you how fast the year goes. Um, I can't believe how time flies and I'm trying to enjoy every precious minute of it a little bit more. All right, well, enough about philosophy. Contact us if you're interested in fall semester classes. We have a lot of good stuff like nutrition and obesity, um, statistics and biology and psychology and the diet and lifestyle intervention course and uh, stuff that you can gain continuing education credit for. So pampopper at msn.com is my email address. Contact me and we can chat about your future in the healthcare field with us or maybe doing your own thing too. Okay, two topics today. Um, according to a new meta-analysis, probiotics are not effective for weight loss and improving body mass index. Researchers wrote that they were inspired to examine the relationship between um, the gut microbiome and obesity and probiotics and weight loss because human and animal studies both have shown that there are changes in the gut microbiome in people who are overweight or obese. Now, they correctly stated that researchers have claimed there's a relationship. I'll get to that in a second here. But they also claim that we can't explain our epidemic of obesity by just simply attributing it to higher calorie intake. I have some issues with that, but I'll come back to that in a little bit too. Literature Search identified 368 articles uh, that looked at this issue, but only four were randomized controlled trials that compared probiotics with a placebo. These are the studies that were included in the analysis. Um, the studies involve giving patients lactobacillus, mostly, in doses averaging 10 billion CFUs. That's not a big dose, by the way. Delivered in capsule form or in yogurt or in placebo. The researchers concluded that probiotics did not facilitate weight loss. They really didn't make a difference. They also said, and of course this is always the answer to everything, we need more randomized controlled trials that look at this issue. Now, I'm not surprised at the results of this analysis, and I've been predicting this for a very long time. Now, the reason why we are doing these kinds of studies, looking at the effects of probiotics on weight loss, is because both medical professionals and consumers alike like magic bullet solutions to complicated problems. So wouldn't you love to, if you're carrying 50 extra pounds, find out that all you have to do is buy $30 worth of probiotics and take one in the morning and one in the evening and the weight would start to drop off. I mean, I wish it were true. I'm sure we'd make a lot of money selling probiotics here at Wellness Forum Health if that were the case. But there's another reason too, and that is that medical professionals are very quick to take an observation. In this case, changes in the microbiome of the gut uh, corresponding to obesity and convert it to a cause and effect relationship. Therefore, changed microbiota causes obesity. And those are not, the fact that they coexist doesn't mean that it's um, a cause and effect relationship. Um, and, and, and then let's, let's do a test to see or a study to see if we can give people probiotics and the weight will drop off. Now, this is a very attractive alternative, first of all, if you've been dealing with weight issues for a long time. And if you're not particularly interested in hearing that there is a little bit of personal responsibility involved in, first of all, developing a weight problem and a lot of responsibility involved in doing something about it. I'm not saying it's easy to do, but I am saying that people do like the magic pill solutions for this stuff and boy, I wish they worked too. All right, so here's what we know about the relationship between the gut microbiome and obesity and other health conditions. Let's just clarify this. Diet affects the composition of the gut microbiome and that's both the quantity of the bacteria and the quality of the bacteria. Now here's the thing, beneficial bacteria like the remnants of carbohydrate, we find carbohydrate in plant foods. Um, the pathogenic bacteria, they like the remnants of animal foods and fat and refined and processed foods. So many overweight people eat a lot of those kinds of foods which damages the gut microbiome and favors proliferation of pathogenic bacteria. Now there's another issue too, which is that obesity increases generalized inflammation because fat cells pump out inflammatory cytokines that raises the inflammation level. We know inflammation has a negative effect on the gut microbiome. And so what I'm saying here is that um, obesity, uh, the gut microbiome change, changes do not cause obesity. Obesity and poor diet cause the changes in the microbiota. So you can give people probiotics till the cows come home and you're not gonna see changes 
uh, in in the um, uh, in the weight of, of people. All right. So I acknowledge, by the way, that there are a lot of things that have affected our growth in the overweight and obesity rates, and and these include an abundance of food, um, ignorance about the right diet for humans, conflicting information. Everybody can claim confusion. We don't know what the right diet is. Uh, emotional eating, the influence of industry on food policy and government recommendations, but. We're not going to address complicated issues like this with magic pills. So, you know, there is a lot of diet and lifestyle involved, and I agree that probiotics can be helpful as adjuvants, you know, part of a diet and lifestyle program to lose weight and improve health. I think probiotics can be marvelously helpful, but um, by themselves, they're not going to resolve these health issues. I mean, again, I wish it were true. It would be good news for all of us, and I certainly wouldn't have to spend so much time on the issue, and you wouldn't have to spend so much time listening to it. All right, so next topic. Um, I think we've all arrived at some things we can agree on. Of all the things that we disagree on, let's focus for a minute on something we agree on. Children's eating habits are increasingly more concerning. I mean, the number of kids who are overweight and obese is increasing. Um, and I think everybody is concerned and maybe alarmed is the better term because younger and younger kids are developing issues, health issues that we used to associate with, with older and older adults. I, I think back with, I mean, just, I'm still flabbergasted at the fact that the American Academy of Pediatrics says we gotta test eight year olds for cholesterol and put them on statin drugs if they can't get their cholesterol levels up to acceptable um, numbers with uh, just diet and lifestyle changes. Well, uh, I've said for years, part of the problem is that kids who um, are not eating a health promoting diet as kids and develop health issues that track into adulthood at a severe disadvantage uh, from the standpoint of physical health. But a growing body of research is showing that there are other serious consequences of poor childhood nutrition and diets that affect their adult lives, including diminished cognitive function. Very interesting study. Finnish researchers tested 428 kids between the ages of 6 and 8 to determine the relationship between cognitive function and diet. They reported that the quality of the children's diet was directly related to their scores for uh, that they got on tests for brain function and that the relationship was stronger for boys than for girls. Now, what the researchers did is they scored the kids' diets based on two different diets. Uh, one was the DASH diet, the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. The other one was the Baltic Sea Diet score. And then they compared those scores with the kids' cognitive test scores. Now, both diets, I won't go into the details, but both diets measured the intakes of whole foods like fruit, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains, and then certain nutrients like sugar, polyunsaturated fat, saturated fat, and sodium. The overall diet scores had higher, stronger, had stronger associations with cognitive functions than individual foods and nutrients alone. In other words, the dietary pattern was far more important than individual foods and nutrients. That's very consistent with the advice that we've been giving at Wellness Farm Health for a good number of years. I mean, I, so how many times can I say it? There are no magical foods and nutrients. It's the dietary pattern we have to get right. As for the reason why boy, boys are more affected than girls, the researchers wrote that there's some evidence that male brains are more vulnerable to stress than female brains. Of course, I've always said the female species is superior, of course, right? Well, all kidding aside, the boys actually um, were eating more red meat, sausage, and sodium than the girls, so even that seems to be diet related. And it may go to a dose dependent response. The more of the bad stuff you eat, the worse cognitive function becomes. As for, um, uh, and, and basically what, um, uh, what the researchers wrote is adequate nutrition is the foundation of normal physical and cognitive development in children. Undernourishment and low availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods have been found to decrease cognitive functions in children. They went on to say, abundance of foods containing lots of sucrose and saturated fat has been linked to cognitive decline in adults. In fact, unhealthy food choices may be a more important determinant of decreased, decreased cognition than undernourishment among children in developed countries, including Finland. In other words, the authors are saying children in developed countries aren't really suffering from deficiency conditions and supplementing with individual foods and nutrients does not improve cognitive health. What these kids are suffering from is the overall effect of a poor diet, and it's only through changing that dietary pattern that we're gonna see things change. Furthermore, while cognitive decline is usually function, we, we associate it with, with um, older age, it may actually begin in childhood. In other words, now we can look at kids perhaps not only tracking into adulthood um, with physical diseases, uh, degenerative conditions that they 
shouldn't get until they're much older and probably could be avoided in most people entirely. But now they're starting with a distinct disadvantage from a cognitive standpoint and perhaps at risk to develop dementia at even earlier ages. In other words, you know, I, I think of dementia, I think of somebody who's 95. Not that it should be that way, but you know, that's the vision that pops up in my head. Um, we're seeing kids now in grade school who have cognitive decline, and maybe the onset of dementia for them is going to be in their 40s and 50s. I don't know, but I think there's a lot we can do about it. We can stop feeding our kids garbage. That would be a step in the right direction. And um, we got to get control of that situation. We've got to stop waiting for the schools to fix it. We've got to stop waiting for the government to fix it. Schools and the government aren't going to fix anything. Individual families can fix this. That's where the power is and that's what we've got to pay attention to. All right, that's all for today. Uh, as usual, pass this on to anybody else who you think might enjoy watching it and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.